Hello and welcome back to another video here at Mega Jordanary. Today's video is going to be a long one. So I would advise you now to get a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, a beverage, a snack and sit tight and get ready for the show. It took me ages to research this case and I mean ages and I always like write my notes out when I'm researching so my arm was literally dead for the entire day. But it's one that I have been intrigued by for ever basically and I'm pretty sure the whole world is intrigued by it too. Before I begin I want to do a little disclaimer. So all of the topics that I'm going to be discussing in this video contain information that I have obtained from the internet. They are in no way shape or form intended to offend or upset anyone. It is merely for educational purposes. The information is readily accessible online for the masses. I have just simply accumulated it all into one video and put it into my own words. So without further ado, today I'm going to be discussing the infamous case of Jack the Ripper. So Jack the Ripper is an unidentified serial killer that terrorised the streets of London, specifically the Whitechapel area in the late 1800s. It is believed that Jack the Ripper has a total of five victims and these victims are known as the Canical Five. I'm going to go through the victims now but I will go into more detail about the victims individually at a later point in this video. The first believed victim of Jack the Ripper is Mary Ann Nichols, whose body was discovered on the 31st of August 1888. Jack the Ripper's next believed victim was Annie Chapman, who was discovered on September the 8th, 1888. His third victim was Elizabeth Stride, whose body was found on the 30th of September 1888, followed by Catherine Eddowes on the same night, the 30th of September 1888. And the Ripper's alleged last victim was believed to be Mary Jane Kelly, who was found on November the 9th, 1888. All of the Ripper victims were ladies of the night who lived and worked in the East End of London. Now the manner in which the victims were found, the manner in which the Ripper had murdered these women was very peculiar indeed. So I just want to give a little warning. I am now going to be discussing some graphic descriptions of how these women were murdered and it is coming up now. So I will put a timestamp below if you want to skip this and move on to the next part. The Ripper mutilated the abdominal region of these women. It is said that he removed three of his victims' internal organs. He removed Catherine Eddowes' left kidney and uterus, but they were never found. Annie Chapman's small intestines were removed and placed above her right shoulder. And the police said that parts of Annie's uterus and bladder had also been removed. Mary Jane Kelly's was the most graphic of all. Investigators actually believed that this murder took place over two hours. So the Ripper removed Mary Jane Kelly's uterus, kidneys, one of her breasts, and he placed them beneath her head. Mary Jane's heart was also removed. Investigators and officers that were at the crime scene said it was nowhere to be seen and they never located her heart. Now, London in 1888 and the late 1800s was a totally different ball game, a totally different universe than what we know that London is to be in this present day. In the late 1800s, it was still in the Victorian era. So poverty and crime were at an all time high in London. The streets were absolutely diabolically filthy and rampant with disease. The housing situation was also out of control. Most of the houses were overcrowded and there would be families and strangers living in one bedroom in houses and they would share beds, they would use it to cook, they would use it to go to the toilet. And it was awful damp and cold conditions that these housing units facilities were like there was no like heating or anything like that you know because it was so depressing and miserable to live in london at the time most of the people of london were turning to alcohol to basically detach themselves from reality there was no real work at the time for men or women really but the women often had to turn to prostitution to make ends meet. I just want to note that all of the Ripper victims were prostitutes and were all addicted to alcohol as well. This made them even more vulnerable to predators and made them even more vulnerable to the Ripper. Now I'm going to discuss the victims individually and give you a bit of background on them and a bit of background on the time and day of their murder. So Marianne Nicholls, who is believed to be the Ripper's first victim, was born and bred in London. She was married to a man named William Nicholls for a period of time and they had six children together. However, William left Mary for their neighbour. This was said to have plummeted Mary into 
absolute devastation and despair. So it ultimately led to turning to prostitution to make her money. Now, on the day of Mary's murder, it was said that she had tried to pay for a bed at a lodging accommodation, but this was common at the time. People would just try and pay their way, like, a night they'd try and get a bed for a night with the money that they had earned throughout the day. But Mary had no money left because it was said that she had squandered it all on alcohol throughout the day. A witness claimed to have seen Mary at about 2.30 a.m., drunk and kind of staggering around, near the Whitechapel Road. And then sadly at 3.45 a.m. Mary's body was discovered by two men in the place that she was last seen on the Whitechapel Road. Now the Ripper's second victim, Annie Chapman, was actually born in Paddington but then she spent most of her life near Windsor, Windsor Castle, close to the Royals. Not quite in the Royal Circle obviously but it was still a quite affluent area irregardless. Annie was married to a man named John Chapman. And the couple had three children together. It was said that their son, their only son, was born with a disability. It apparently caused extreme stressors within their marriage and it caused Annie and John to both turn to alcohol. At the time, it was almost shunned upon for people to have children that were disabled and so they actually put their only son into a home for disabled children. And then one of John and Annie's daughters actually died from meningitis when she was just 12 years old. So this was literally the tip of the iceberg and it caused John and Annie to actually separate. In 1884, it's believed. And John then had custody of their surviving daughter. So Annie was said to have been very malnourished in and around the time of her murder. Three days before she died, she was seen getting in a fight with a local woman over a bar of soap. And that woman actually had marked Annie's face, like with a big gash. And when Annie's body was found at around 6am, three days after the fight behind 29 Hanbury Street, she had the gash on her face. Now the third victim of the Ripper Elizabeth Stride was originally from Horslanda near Gothenburg in Sweden. She moved to London in February of 1866. She told her friends and family that she was going to work as a cleaner or a housekeeper for a very rich man in London who lived near Hyde Park. But it was very well documented by the Swedish police that Elizabeth was actually already a prostitute in Sweden before she relocated to London. So her, you know, her story started off a lot different than most of the Ripper's victims who turned to prostitution as a result of their marriage breakup. We don't know what led her to fall into this lifestyle. In March 1869, Elizabeth actually married a man who was 20 years older than her. His name was John Thomas Stride. How many Johns were actually in London at this time? that Elizabeth and John actually separated at one point but then they got back together and rekindled their romance until John ultimately died. So Elizabeth had been lodging on and off in the years prior and leading up to her death at 32 Flower and Dean Street and Elizabeth was seen the night of her murder by a couple of witnesses actually. The first sighting of her that night was at around 11 p.m. in the doorway of a pub called the Bricklayer's Arms on Settle Street and the witness said that she was standing in the doorway with a man that was approximately five foot five inches tall with a black moustache wearing a long coat, as they called it back then, and a billy cock hat. This has kind of given me the image that we now know as the image of Jack the Ripper. Then at around half 12, 12.30 a.m., a police officer seen a man and a woman at Duffield's Yard, which is the location that Elizabeth's body was found. The officer described the man as late 20s, dark moustache, dark complexion, a dark overcoat, a dark hat, and about five foot seven inches tall. And he then confirmed that the woman that he did see was definitely Elizabeth Stride. Now the last sighting of Elizabeth was by a man called Israel Swartz, who was a Hungarian Jew that had recently emigrated to London. He seen Elizabeth 30 minutes before her body was found in Dustfield's yard. He said that he seen a man about 5 or 5 inches tall, about 30 years of age, with dark hair, dark moustache, fair complexion, and he said the man was slightly, or appeared to be slightly intoxicated. He said that he seen this man pull a woman, who he later identified as Elizabeth Stride, onto the street and throw her onto the ground. He said that the woman then kind of shouted, but she didn't like scream as if she was in extreme distress. 
Israel said that he just assumed it was a domestic and he didn't want to get involved but he then said that a second man appeared and the man that was attacking Elizabeth kind of shouted something at the second man and he said then that the second man started following him so Israel panicked and started running. He said the second man was about middle 30s around 5'11", light brown hair, light moustache, was wearing a dark overcoat and an old black felt hat. So did Jack the Ripper have an accomplice? Now it's believed that Israel couldn't speak any English at the time so the evidence that he gave was through a translator. Police ruled out the idea of the Ripper having an accomplice because apparently they traced the man and he hadn't got anything to do with it. So then at 1am Elizabeth's body was found in Dustfield's yard. One thing about Elizabeth's body, it wasn't mutilated like the other victims bodies were. So that caused people to speculate that maybe it wasn't the Ripper and maybe it was just a random attack, a domestic gone wrong. But if you were to go by Israel's account, it seems that he was disturbed and maybe he didn't have time to do his usual killing method. I don't know if that's what you call it. And so this leads us on to Catherine Eddowes, who was found murdered shortly after Elizabeth Stride. Catherine Eddowes was originally from Wolverhampton and then she moved to Birmingham where she had three children with a man named Thomas Conway and then they moved to London in around 1868. So when Catherine and her partner moved to London with the kids it is said that this is when Catherine started taking up her liking to alcohol. She ultimately left her family then in the 1880s. After she left her family, she met a new man called Shock John Kelly, another John. And so when she met him and became alcohol dependent, she then subsequently began selling her body for money. Money to pay rent to put a roof over her head. But eventually she couldn't afford the rent anymore. So it's believed that she slept rough in a room at a property at 26 Dorset Street. Now on the night of her murder, Catherine Eddowes was actually released from police custody at Bishopsgate Police Station because she was arrested for being drunk and disorderly, basically the equivalent of what that would be back in the day. Apparently she was in the middle of a crowd, extremely intoxicated and then fell asleep and no one knew who she was, where she lived. So the police brought her to the police station to essentially sober her up. So when Catherine sobered up, she was released from police custody and the last sighting of her was at around 1.35 a.m. by three men. These men said that they seen Catherine standing talking to a man near to a Jewish synagogue. Now one of the witnesses described the man as a bigger man, a moustached man with a navy jacket, a red scarf and a cap. Then at 1.45 a.m., just 10 minutes after these three men had seen Catherine talking to this man near the entrance of the synagogue, Catherine's body was found in the southwest centre of Mitre Square by the policeman PC Edward Watkins. Now the final victim of Jack the Ripper is Mary Jane Kelly. She was actually the youngest victim. She was only 25 years old when she was murdered and she suffered the most violent death of all the victims. Mary Jane's origins are quite cloudy but it's believed that she was born in Limerick in Ireland. And because of the Irish famine, her dad had moved his whole family to Wales to find him work. But in 1884, Mary moved to London where she had worked at a few jobs before she met a French woman and the two of them found work in a high-end brothel in the West End of London. Now Mary Jane had been renting a room at Miller's Court off Dorset Street for a couple of months prior to her passing. She was living with a man named Joseph Barnett. She was said to have had an intimate relationship with this man on and off but eventually separated after Mary Jane had welcomed a friend of hers who was also a prostitute into the room to stay with them because she'd nowhere else to go. Barnett said that they still remained friends and he actually said that he seen her on the night of her murder. He said the last time he seen her was around 7.30 to 7.45 p.m. on the night. And he said that he spent around an hour with her. So at 10.45 a.m. the next day, Mary's landlord, John McCarty, had sent a man named Thomas Bower around to Mary Jane's house to collect her rent that was over. You. Thomas said that he knocked on the door and there was no answer but he did believe that she was inside so he went around to the side of the property that she was in and moved a curtain out of the way that was covering cracked glass and that is where he seen Mary Jane's body in a horrific way. Now there were actually 11 murders in Whitechapel between the 3rd of April 1888 
to the 13th of February 1891. These murders are collectively known by the London Metropolitan Police as the Whitechapel murders, but they only linked five definitively to Jack the Ripper. But I'm gonna mention these other murders anyway, just for the sake of the video. So a 45 year old prostitute named Emma Smith was assaulted and robbed in Whitechapel in the early hours of the morning of the 3rd of April, 1888. She did initially survive the attack and she told the police officers that it was three men that attacked her, one of them being a teenager. However, at 9 a.m., a couple of hours after her attack, Emma passed away from her injuries. And then on the 7th of August, 1888, Martha Tabram was found murdered at around 2.30 a.m. in George Yard, Whitechapel. She had died as a result of 38 stab wounds. A woman named Rose Mylett was strangled to death. She was found by a police officer in Clark's Yard, just off Poplar High Street near Whitechapel. However, there's conflicting reports of murder and that she may have accidentally taken her own life by accidental hanging. And then there was a woman named Alice Mackenzie who was found dead at 12.40 a.m. on the 17th of July, 1889, in Castle Alley, Whitechapel. She was also said to have been a prostitute and was killed in a very similar manner to the Ripper victims, very similar manner. The police reckoned that this may have been a copycat killing, which you see a lot of people get obsessed with these serial killers and try and imitate the crimes, which is twisted. It happens. And then there's the Pynchon Street Torso. So on the 10th of September, 1889, the torso of a woman was found at around 5.15 a.m. under a railway arch at Pynchon Street Station in Whitechapel and no other body parts were ever found and the woman was never identified. This has been linked to the Thames torso killer. There was a torso found in the Thames River and there was also a torso found in Chelsea and one in Rainham and the police reckon that these are connected or they're not connected to the Ripper killings because it's very rare that a serial killer will ever change their modus operandi and that's very true. I mean it's not impossible but it's highly 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 unlikely. And then the last of the Whitechapel murders as a collective was that of 25 year old Francis Cole who was found dead on Friday the 13th 1891 under a railway arch in Swallow Gardens Whitechapel. She was actually believed to have been found moments after she was murdered by a police officer at around 2.15 a.m. When the police officer found her, she was still alive, but she did die a short time after. There was a man arrested for Francis's murder and his name was James Sadler. So considered James Sadler as a suspect in the Ripper killings, but they subsequently ruled him out because he was at sea at the time of the first Ripper murder and they didn't have enough evidence to keep him on the murder of Francis, so he was set free. Now, we've spoken about the victims of the Whitechapel murders and the Jack the Ripper killings. So now I wanna talk about some of the suspects in the Jack the Ripper case, because to this day, Jack the Ripper has never been identified. So there's lots of suspects and there's lots of theories which are very, very interesting and there's a whole range of them. But the manner in which the victims were murdered has always led police to believe that the Ripper had some sort of surgical or medical background because it seemed that the Ripper had extensive knowledge of the human anatomy, specifically female anatomy. I told you this video is going to be long. Now, suspect number one is Aaron Kosminski. Aaron Kosminski was a Polish barber who had born sometime between 1864 and 1865, but had come to London and settled in the early 1880s. Aaron was Jewish and he was working as a barber in Whitechapel at the time of the Ripper killings. And his own family said that he had an extreme hatred for women. And his family actually sent him to an asylum in 1889 where he lived out the rest of his days and died there. His family done this because they believed that he had homicidal tendencies. But nowadays people say that what Aaron Kosminski may have been experiencing, which they thought was homicidal tendencies, could have been schizophrenia. It was a completely different time then. You know, they treated mental health and mental illnesses as a completely different thing and they saw it in a completely different way as what we now understand and now view mental health as in the day and age we're living in now, so. But recently, mitochondrial DNA belonging to Aaron Kosminski was found on the shawl of the victim, Katrin Eddowes, 
how they found this out was the DNA was linked to one of Aaron Kosminski's descendants, um, a female descendant, but the DNA that they found was linked to 99% of people of European, Eastern European descent. It's not definitive proof because there's too many holes in the evidence. And also the fact that Catherine Eddowes was a prostitute, she could have come into contact with him at any point without him being her killer. Now, suspect number two is Walter Sickert. Walter Sickert was an artist who was born in Munich in 1860 and emigrated to London in 1869, so when he was just nine years of age. Now, he was well known for painting pictures of prostitutes and investigators believe that he may have actually hidden clues to the Ripper killings in some of his paintings. One thing about Walter is that he was said to have been impotent after undergoing a lot of operations on his genitalia. And I think it needs to be noted that many serial killers in history have been proven to be impotent. And so the act of murder is said to give them some sort of warped gratification, which is absolutely blah. There are two really famous letters that Jack the Ripper was said to have sent to the Metropolitan Police to taunt them. Let's think Zodiac Killer, that kind of vibe. Although Jack the Ripper obviously done it first. The first letter was addressed to the Central London News Agency and it was received 27th of September 1888. And the letter was labelled Dear Boss. It's actually regarded as the first piece of correspondence between Jack the Ripper and the police and he actually coined himself as Jack the Ripper because the person who wrote this letter signed off as Jack the Ripper. And then the second letter is the From Hell letter which is so scary. It was sent alongside half a human kidney to the chairman of Whitechapel in October 1888. In the letter he actually says that he a some of the organs that he had abstracted from some of his victims. I feel sick even talking about this. Oh, So these are the two letters to actually be believed to be from Jack the Ripper but there were 700 other letters and this is like people sending in like tip off saying that they think that they know who the Ripper might be etc etc but mitochondrial DNA was found on some of these letters that matched DNA on several letters from Walter Sickert. But again, experts say this is just not enough to convince them that Walter was the Ripper. Suspect number three is Karl Feigenbaum. He was a German merchant sailor and his own lawyer actually believes him to be the Ripper because he was arrested and put to death, executed in America for murdering his landlord in a very, very similar manner to that of the Ripper killings. Now, over the years, Carl was said to go by different aliases, but he was said to have been working on the ships that were docked at Whitechapel on every single one of the Ripper killings. And he moved to the USA in 1890. Now, the fourth suspect is Montag John Druitt. Montag was a very educated man. He had studied at Oxford and he was also an assistant schoolmaster in London. Experts think that he could have been the Ripper because he was deemed to be sexually insane. And he was seen in the area of Whitechapel at the time of the killings and he was said to have known the area like the back of his hand. Which would kind of make sense as the Ripper got away so quick. The Ripper was gone like that and no one even seen him. Well, people did see him but they weren't able to find him. So he must have known the ins and outs, every back alley, every escape route known to man in Whitechapel. Now, Montag's body was found floating in the River Thames on the 9th of November, 1888, and is believed that he took his own life several weeks prior to his body being discovered. So this would put his death uh, around the time of the last Ripper murder, Mary Jane Kelly's death, which was several weeks before too. And that was the last Ripper victim, so that's interesting. I always heard people saying that it was the Queen surgeon that done it. It was a member of the royal family that was said to be the Ripper. So now I'm going to talk about the royal connection because it's weird. So Prince Albert Victor, Duke of Clarence and Avondale, 
Queen Victoria's grandson, is rumoured to have been Jack the Ripper. Now, it was rumoured that Prince Albert may have been gay, which was illegal at the time. And these rumours kind of surfaced around 1889, when London police shut down a male brothel and discovered one of the clients had connections to Albert. In the 1960s, a book called Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution, written by a man named Stephen Knight, claims that Prince Albert contracted syphilis from a prostitute in the West Indies after he had went on a royal tour there, and that it had actually began to attack his brain, which ultimately made Prince Albert seek revenge against prostitutes. And so the theory goes, he took it out on the prostitutes of London. Second theory to do with Prince Albert being the Ripper, and that is that he fell in love with a Catholic woman, a commoner, and that he had married her and had a child. And the royal family did not vibe with that whatsoever. And so here he goes that they hired somebody to kill these prostitutes, make it look like a serial killer, because these women that were murdered apparently all knew about Prince Albert's relationship and marriage with this common Catholic woman. So they had to be silenced. Now, let's talk about the royal surgeon. Sir John Williams. Sir John Williams was a Welsh physician and a physician to Queen Victoria. He was accused of being the Ripper in a 2005 book called Uncle Jack, which was written by a great, great nephew. The theory goes that John and his wife couldn't have children. So he was desperate to find out what causes infertility or could he find a cure to infertility and thus committed these heinous crimes on these women. Now, the alleged great-great-great-granddaughter of the last Ripper victim, Mary Jane Kelly, whose name is Antonia Alexander, claims that she found a 125-year-old locket in Mary Jane Kelly's possessions. That was like a family heirloom. And in the locket, there was a photograph of a man. But Antonia claims that this picture is without a doubt Sir John Williams because apparently it's known within the family that Mary Jane had an affair with a London-based doctor who had brought her on luxurious trips to like Paris and stuff, but the affair was called off and he married another woman and she went on with her life. I think this is the most compelling theory of them all, so I definitely saved the best until last. Oh, this is the most interesting. To get my little TikTok theory up. The theory is that H.H. H. Holmes, the first American serial killer, the man who created the murder castle, horrific, absolutely just despicable crimes took place there. And if you want me to do a full video on H.H. H. Holmes, let me know down in the comments and I will get that. I will do that video. The theory goes that Jack the Ripper murders ended. So the trail of the murders in Whitechapel and the Ripper murders end at the start of 1891. The H.H. H. Holmes murders begin at the end of 1891. Now ship records show that a H.H. H. Holmes made the journey from England to America during this time period. During the start and end of 1891, H.H. H. Holmes traveled from London to America. Now, people say there was a lot of people with the surname Holmes, so it could have been anyone. And that H.H. H. Holmes did go under a lot of aliases throughout his life. But H.H. H. Holmes was said to have been an avid document keeper. But during this time period, he didn't keep any documents. There's no proof that he was actually in the UK. Experts believe that if H.H. H. Holmes was indeed Jack the Ripper, that he could have been creating his his killing technique whilst in the UK. H.H. H. Holmes removed his victim's organs. Jack the Ripper removed his victim's organs. H.H. H. Holmes was a qualified doctor. Jack the Ripper is heavily thought to have been in the medical profession. Sketches of what the Ripper was supposedly said to have looked like, drawn from the testimonies of the 13 witnesses that did claim to have seen him prior to the murders, are said to eerily, and they do eerily match H.H. H. Holmes. It's kind of weird because a lot of the men back then all looked alike. The great-great-grandson of H.H. H. Holmes, Jeff Mudge, says that the similarities between the Ripper 
and H.H. H. Holmes are eerily similar and that if the cases were both happening in this day and age, they would absolutely warrant an arrest. And the letters. The letters that we spoke about, especially the infamous Dear Boss one, some of the wording and the phrases in that letter are very Americanized, especially for the time. So it would make sense, linguistic say, if the killer was actually an American. And now I want to talk about this TikToker that I came across called Ashley Summer. It, they're wild. So she's basically a psychic medium and she does tarot readings. It's all like in jest. It's kind of fun. It's innocent. Obviously, there's no proof from tarot readings. That she, it will just, there's no proof. But on two occasions, Ashley asks the tarot cards if Jack the Ripper went to America after leaving London. And then the second one she asks, was H.H. H. Holmes responsible for the Jack the Ripper killings? You need to open okay. Conspiracy Tarot, is H.H. H. Holmes the same individual that is known as Jack the Ripper? The Magician for yes and the Page of Wands for no. I was hoping someone would ask this because I want to know too um, and talk about it on video. Like, I would have done this either way, but. Hmm. Sorry. Stimming problems. Um. Yes, dude. The devil. Empress. He wanted to kill women. Oh, something in the shadows about female cross. We have come to the end of the Jack the Ripper video. What do you think? I need to know your thoughts in the comments because I feel like every single person that we've mentioned has some sort of probability of being the Ripper. Personally, I do think that it was H.H. H. Holmes. That's that's what my gut is telling me, that it was H.H. H. Holmes. But let me know your thoughts in the comment section. So thank you for watching this video. Please give it a big like, thumbs up, subscribe to our channel. It would mean the absolute world to me. I literally put my heart and soul into these videos. I love researching the videos. I love speaking about the videos. I love filming the videos. I love editing the videos. I love given the videos to you all. I just really love doing it and it would just make my day if you subscribed and showed this video some love. So I will see you soon. Bye!